Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're jumping right into maybe the biggest question out there. Why is there anything? Why isn't there just nothing? Mm. I mean, you look around, there's stars, planets, us. But back near the Big Bang, theory says matter and antimatter. Its sort of opposite twin should have appeared in perfect balance. Right. Equal amounts. And these twins, well, they don't get along. Exactly. Opposite charges, same mass. They meet, they annihilate, boom, back to energy. So you'd expect this great annihilation right at the start. Even just radiation, essentially. A very empty, very boring universe. And yet, clearly, that's not what happened. We're here. So that's the mystery, isn't it? How did matter get the edge? That's the core puzzle. What tiny imbalance allowed matter to survive that initial firefight? And the reason we're diving into this now is some really interesting news you flagged coming from the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. That's right. Some fresh experimental results that give us a new angle on this very old question. So this deep dive, we're going to unpack that LHC finding. See what it tells us about why the universe is full of, well, stuff. And it's worth mentioning, you know, some people hear something from nothing and think philosophy. Sure. But this specific question, why more matter than antimatter? Physicists see that as firmly in our court. It's something we can test, something we can measure. Okay, so let's break down the problem. This idea of matter just popping into existence sounds weird, oh. but quantum physics allows for it, these quantum fluctuations. It does, yeah. In the vacuum of space, energy can briefly fluctuate, creating a particle and its antiparticle pair, something and its opposite, pairing from nothing. But critically, it's always a pair. Equal amount. Always balanced, exactly. Yeah. You start with zero net charge, zero net everything else important, and you end up with zero net charge. The matter cancels the antimatter in that sense. Okay, but then comes the annihilation problem again. They appear together, they meet. Poof. Right. They annihilate almost instantly, turning back into energy. So even if pairs are constantly popping in and out of existence, it doesn't explain a lasting surplus of one over the other. This brings us to this idea of CP symmetry. Yes, CP symmetry. Right. It's a fundamental concept. C stands for charge conjugation, swapping a particle for its antiparticle. P is parity, looking at its mirror image. Okay. Yeah. CP symmetry basically says the laws of physics should look exactly the same if you do both swaps, simultaneously flip the particle to its antiparticle, and view it in a mirror. So if the universe was perfectly CP symmetric... Then matter and antimatter would behave absolutely identically in every single way. Yeah. No difference in how they decay, interact, nothing. And if they behave identically, there's no way for one to win out over the other. The annihilation would be complete. Precisely. You'd end up with that universe of just radiation we mentioned. Yeah. No galaxies, no stars, no us. Obviously. Yeah, he here we are. The universe we actually live in is just overwhelmingly matter. Undeniably. Everywhere we look, it's matter, matter, matter. The amount of antimatter is minuscule, created fleetingly in high energy events, but not you know, making up galaxies. So where did it all go? That's the asymmetry, right? The matter, antimatter asymmetry. Exactly. The estimates are that for every, say, billion pairs of matter and antimatter particles created in the Big Bang's aftermath, uh -huh. there was maybe one extra particle of matter, just yeah. one in a billion. That's it. One in a billion survived. That tiny leftover fraction after all the pairs annihilated, that's what formed everything. All the structure, all the complexity we see today comes from that tiny initial imbalance. Oh, okay. And the standard model of particle physics, our best theory of this stuff, it struggles with this. It does. It predicts matter and antimatter should be almost perfectly symmetrical. There are mechanisms within the standard model that allow for some CP violation, some difference. Not enough. Not nearly enough, no. Huh? Not enough to explain that one in a billion surplus we observe. That's one of the big... Uh, limitations, you could say, of the standard model. So, to get that surplus, CP symmetry must have been violated more strongly in the early universe. Matter and antimatter had to play by slightly different rules. That's the going hypothesis, yes. There had to be some process, some interaction, where matter had a slight edge, maybe decayed slightly differently, or interacted in a way that favored its survival. And we have seen hints of this CQ violation before, right? Not in protons and neutrons, but other particles. We have, yes. The first observations were in particles called mesons. These are made of two quarks, a quark and an antiquark, actually. Okay. Specifically, experiments found CP violation in mesons containing strange quarks, and later, more significantly, in those containing bottom quarks, or beauty quarks, as they're also known. So we knew the symmetry wasn't perfect, at least for these meson particles. Right. We knew there were cracks in the mirror, so to speak. 
But those observations, while important, didn't directly involve the particles that make up most ordinary matter. Which brings us to this new LHC result, because this <laughs> involves baryons. Remind us what those are. Baryons are the heavyweights. They're made of three quarks. And the most famous baryons are protons and neutrons. Ah, okay. The stuff atoms are made of, the stuff we're made of. Exactly. Protons and neutrons make up the nucleus of every atom. So understanding if they or baryons like them, behave differently from their antimatter counterparts is, well, it's fundamental to this whole question. And that's the breakthrough. The LHCb experiment at CERN found CP violation in baryons. For the first time, yes, specifically in baryons containing a bottom quark. This is a landmark result. Okay, tell us about the LHC first. How does it even make these particles? Right, so the LHC is this huge 27-kilometer ring underground it accelerates beams of protons incredibly close to the speed of light mm -hmm. and then smashes them together head on. The energy released in these collisions is immense and it creates a whole shower of exotic short-lived particles, including these bottom baryons. And LHCb, the B is for bottom. It's designed to look at those. Precisely. It's one of the main experiments of the LHC and its specialty is studying particles containing bottom or beauty quarks, hunting for exactly these kinds of matter-antimatter differences. So what specific decay, what process were they watching? They were looking very carefully at a specific decay of a bottom baryon called the lambda B0 and its antiparticle, the anti-lambda B0. Okay. This particle or antiparticle decays into several other particles, a proton or antiproton, a kaon, and two peons. They measured how often the baryon decayed this way compared to how often the antibaryon decayed the same way. So comparing rates, did matter decay differently than antimatter? They found a difference, yes. About a 2.5% difference in the decay patterns between the matter lambda B and the antimatter version. 2.5% sounds small. It is small. <laughs> but crucially, the statistical significance is very high. They reported it at 5.2 sigma. And 5 sigma is the magic number in particle physics, the threshold for discovery. It generally is, yes. It means the probability of this result being just a random fluke, a statistical bump, is less than one in several million. It's well, considered solid evidence. Wow. Okay, so this is real. Baryons related to protons and neutrons do show CP violation. What's the big picture implication? It's huge. It's the first direct evidence that the fundamental building blocks of ordinary matter, these three quark particles, don't behave identically to their antimatter counterparts. So the asymmetry isn't just in those less common mesons. Exactly it suggests this might be a more general property. If bottom baryons violate CP symmetry, it makes it much more plausible that protons and neutrons themselves might have subtle differences from antiprotons and antineutrons, perhaps through processes that were important in the early universe. It hints that the very stuff we're made of has this built-in bias. That's the exciting possibility, yes. A fundamental asymmetry that could explain why matter won out. It puts the asymmetry right where it needs to be in the building blocks themselves. Okay, monumental step. But does this 2.5% difference in this one specific decay, does that solve the whole puzzle? Is that enough asymmetry to explain the one in a billion cosmic surplus? Ah, uh, well, no, not on its own. That's the catch. Right. While incredibly important for confirming that CP violation happens in baryons, the amount they measured in this particular decay mode is still way too small to account for the entire cosmic matter dominance. So we found a piece of the puzzle, maybe a crucial piece, but not the whole picture yet. Exactly. There must be other sources of CP violation out there. Or perhaps this effect was much stronger under the extreme conditions of the early universe. Or maybe both. So the search continues. Where else are physicists looking for this missing asymmetry? A lot of focus now is on the lepton sector. That's particles like electrons and, crucially, neutrinos. Neutrinos. Those weird ghost particles. Those are the ones. They come in three types or flavors, and they can change or oscillate mm -hmm. between these flavors as they travel. There's a strong theoretical motivation and some tentative experimental hints that CP symmetry might be violated in these neutrino oscillations that neutrinos might oscillate slightly differently than antineutrinos. And finding that could be the key. It could be a very significant part of the answer, yes. There are major experiments currently running and being built specifically to measure this with high precision. Things like NOVIA and the upcoming DON experiment at Fermilab in the U.S. Right. And T2K and the next generation hyper Kamiokande experiment in Japan, they're all gunning for neutrino CP violation. And what if even the neutrinos don't provide enough asymmetry? What happens then? Well, then we'd likely need to seriously consider physics beyond the standard model. Ah, the new physics. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe they're undiscovered particles, maybe new forces, maybe extra dimensions, things not currently in our theories that could provide the necessary amount of CP violation way back near the Big Bang. This LHCB result is vital because it confirms a mechanism within reach of the standard model, but the scale still seems off. Okay, so let's wrap this up. The big news is this LHC discovery, finding for the first time that baryons the family, including protons and neutrons, don't behave quite the same as their antimatter twins. CP violation confirmed in the building blocks. That's the key takeaway. Yeah. It shows a fundamental asymmetry, right where it counts, in the components of matter itself. It's not the full answer to the why is there something mm. question. But a massive step forward. A really significant step, yes. It validates a core idea about why matter might have survived the early universe. It tells us the mirror between matter and antimatter is definitely cracked, even for the stuff we're made of. It really is profound when you stop and think about it. This tiny, subtle difference in how fundamental particles decay and the entire universe hinges on it. Mm -hmm. Makes you wonder, doesn't it, if there's this asymmetry, what other subtle differences, what other hidden rules might be governing reality that we just haven't uncovered yet? What else is out there? It's a fantastic question. And it highlights that science is this ongoing process of peeling back layers, constantly seeking a deeper understanding of, well, of everything. The quest definitely continues. A quest to understand why we even exist to ask the question. Thanks for walking us through this deep dive today.